Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a, an analytical hypnotherapist as well as a psychological astrologer. And I am joined today by my guest, who is Richard Strozzi Heckler. Hello, Richard. Hello, Anna. Good to be with you. I am really enjoying your book. It's called Embodying the Mystery, Somatic Wisdom for Emotional, Energetic and Spiritual Awakening. And, and this is what it looks like. And I, I guess a good place to start would be with your title. Um, so let's take that word embodying. What do you mean by that? Um, that in some way is a very um, uh, simple question and a complex question. Um, and, and I agree with you, it's a great way to start. Um, if we think of embodying, we realize like, oh, well, here I am in this body and I can tie my shoes. I can drive a car at 80 kilometers per hour. Um, but what we really mean here is this notion of, do we really live in our bodies in a way and we become in touch with that core life energy that animates us and actually animates all things. And the reason we would be compelled to do that is really inside the claim that this life energy, this core energy, really is 3 billion years of evolution, which means wisdom, compassion, and a certain kind of capacity for skillful action. And so that's the fundamental piece of it. There's other places where I work with many leaders, for example, and they might say, oh, I, um, I want to build more trust with my team. But th there's ways that they are being, their behaviors, their embodiment or lack of embodiment doesn't produce trust in others. So what it is, is becoming building distinctions and practices for building trust and not only knowing them, but um, embodying them. And the last thing I'll say here is that Epictetus, one of the great philosophers, Greek philosophers, said, don't explain your philosophy to me, embody it. Being. Oh, become it. So we're talking about becoming, and we're also talking about engaging. Correct, correct. So it's becoming, and then once we are in becoming, how do we want to set our sails to bring forward what kind of a world? You know, a world that is very large in scope. We make, we make um, moves towards kind of writing that or building something into that, or we have our own personal worlds. And how do we become that? Exactly. So the title is Embodying the Mystery. So we've, we've had embodying. Tell us about the mystery. Well, I'll tell you, you know, this work, my, my background is, um, I have a PhD in psychology. Um, I've been doing martial arts for over 50 years, um, 55 years, started when I was 12. Um, been doing Aikido for 50 years and teaching it for a long time and doing the meditation practice for a long time. Now I say all that because there are specific reasons that I entered into all these disciplines and practices. And fundamentally, and to keep it simple, I would say there was a longing in me. There was a longing in me to become the best addition of myself, the best version of myself, to be more fully awake, more compassionate, um, more kind, more respectful, and, and so forth. And through outstanding teachers, I've had outstanding teachers, and through my practices, the further I get along is actually, I would say, the less I know. Um, and what is really moving me is that, oh, we live in this great mystery, and to be compelled by and participating in that mystery is one of the great joys for all of us. Yes, I, I would agree. It's the, it's the great mystery, the life itself. What is it? <laughs> and I, I really like the way that 
in your book, you describe this journey, this, I guess in, some would say awakening to the fact that there is a mystery at all. Um, and it begins with finding uh, the body of a dog. Tell us about that. I'm about, I think maybe seven or eight years old with my group, little group of other seven and eight year old young boys, we decided to go to this creek that we haven't seen for a while. As we approach that creek, we see that there's a dog lying in the shallows. And the moment I see the dog, and I've been around a lot of animals, I realize there was something different about it. And um, fundamentally, uh, it was unscarred, unwounded, it wasn't old, but it was dead. And it immediately picked in me this curiosity of everything looks like a dog and appears like a dog, but something's missing. What is that? Some of the other, my friends, they'd throw pebbles at it or push it with sticks. You know, I touched it. I wanted to feel it. Went home living with my mother and my grandmother, who is a very strong influence with me. I'd like to speak about her later. But I, as I brought up what we did, my mother immediately went into a germ story. Did you touch it? You shouldn't touch it. It could be diseased. I knew she was taking care of me, but it was just not answering my question of what is missing. And my grandmother, um, uh, when there was a pause, said its spirit was gone. And I was, my first question is, what is spirit? And she just waved her large hands around and we were outside and she said, spirit is everywhere. Look at the waving trees. Look at our dog Smokey, you know, all of those things. She said, it's everywhere. And that, you know, Anna was, it was like laying a, a deep seed in a really fertile ground where I was going, what does it mean to have this spirit within us and other things? And that was really the beginning, really truly the beginning of my, my search for, um, what, what would we call it? Uh, source, essence, deep meaning, yes. Just listening to you, and in fact, while when I was reading um, that chapter in your book, I was thinking about the four, I've had four wonderful pets who have, have died um, at different points. Um, one was a bird and the other three were cats. With the cats, what we did, because they died at home, we gave ourselves a day before taking them to the crematorium. And I, we found that extremely helpful because it gave us time to register that the spirit was gone from the body. Mm. that the body that was lying there was no longer our beloved cat or cats. And that made it easier to part with the body, which is, I think, a very hard thing is when, you're, when, you're, when you encounter death and you are suddenly severed from that physical relationship and to have had the opportunity to come to terms with the fact that the spirit was really and truly gone and made it easier to release the body and I think it was just as you were describing in your book and I was listening to you it's such an intangible thing, isn't it? That feeling that this body has no life in it. And it's so different from when it had a life in it. It's a very difficult 
feeling to describe, isn't it? Obviously, there's grief if you know if you know the body, if you have a relationship to the body, there's grief. But there's something else too. There's it's it's almost like a an incomprehension, which is what you described as a little child finding this this body. Yes, and and um, you know when I wrote this book, I it was my ninth book. And I really made the choice that I'm not going to distill anything into a lesson because really at my stage in my work, which is not complete and I'm doing still working in this way, I would say, oh, these are the things that occurred to me in my life. These are the individuals that were teachers, whether explicit or implicit that influenced me. And this is what I thought about it. Because as you said, it's really incomprehensible at some level because one can learn or even embody a number of different behaviors and actions. But if it's really not guided by, and I'll keep calling it spirit, but people can call it what they want, ki or chi, ilan, vital, prana. If it's not guided by that, it really lacks a cer certain kind of, from my point of view, authenticity, our magnetism, our really a sense of power not a power over, but a power with that can happen. And I think that it's something that um, is sadly missing in, in our Western cultures. Yes, I think we have um, largely lost a, a good deal. And I think, I think part of it is that we've also lost that tradition of, of the wake of having the body in the home um, after the death so that everyone can come and, and pay their respects. And, and it's, it's interesting because I've done it with my, my, my cats, but I haven't actually, I'm sure there, there are still people who do it, but it's not very common anymore that somebody would have that in the home. The body is whisked away. Everything's been sanitized. And because it's been sanitized, we're not, we've lost that connection to see, to really appreciate the difference between life and lifeless. Yes, and I, I would also say that um, this notion of, you use the word wake, there's many people that do it different kinds of ways, certain kinds of ceremonies. And um, I think it's true, all the things that you said about it. In other words, coming to terms with this was the shape or the form of our livingness that we were living with all the time, but without this other animating core force, it's, it's different. And that inside of that, um, this wake, is really for the living and it's allowing us to to remember go back in uh, uh, history somewhat in memory and speak the virtues of this person but we it, it i think it opens up this opportunity for our spirits to really connect deeply with the spirits of the living too absolutely it's it's a moment where we have an opportunity it's not just about coming to terms with the loss of the, the physical connection and to share in that with those around us. But I think it's also an opportunity to ask the question and to consider the mystery. Yes, really consider and to bow in and acknowledge the mystery. You know, my, my grandmother, um, her name is Alba, but as, as I learned language, I called her Baba, so it stuck. Um, she came to America as a Swedish immigrant, about 15 with her sister, but she was a, um, she was a, she leaned into the metaphysical world or the world, the spiritual world and she gave seances 
where the Swedish immigrants would come in this dark room, a single cat candle on the table, their hands on the table, and she would say, ask yes or no questions. If it was a yes, the table would bounce once. If it said no, it would bounce twice. And, you know, Anna, there I was like five years old. She said, come in with me and I would stand there. And what was remarkable about it when I look back was it wasn't like, oh, this is really something weird or supernatural or any of that. It was just like, um, it, was, it, was, it became very normalized that there were parallel universes going on. There's something that maybe we weren't trained to touch or feel or smell or be influenced by, but they were definitely there. You know, and she read tea leaves and read palms. And so she was a, uh, she made me look, she opened me. She really opened me in a very kind and gentle way to being receptive to other worlds and the information and wisdom that can come from worlds that may not have bodies as we define them. It seems to me that your experience of her was quite magical. Um, when I look back at it in, in, in also reviewing the many, many people I've worked with, I recognize how um, blessed I was to have somebody at that early age to um, uh, influence me. And it, was, it wasn't like, I'm gonna teach you or anything. It was really her presence, what she was doing. And, um, uh, you know, she, she, she just had a, basically a wonderful loving presence. She was aligned with the Roshacrucians like uni unity. And, um, you know, one of the things that I do in my work and I've been taught by exemplary teachers is doing body work and um, around healing, around embodiment. And she was my first teacher. She'd come back for her. She was a uh, uh, orderly at a, a hospital. She'd take off her, her uh, hose and said, here, can you massage my feet? I'm so tired, I've been on my feet all day. But then she would teach me. She'd go, no, press more here. And when you do this, imagine the cross on the Rosha Crucian cross. So she was teaching me visualizations too and also how to move my energy to connect with another's energy. And in that way, I would say it was magical, like my good fortune, but not magical like it's only for certain people. It was really like, this is a ground of being that we, should, we could all participate in more fully. For, um those in the audience who are not familiar with the Rosicrucians, um, you've made a reference to that. Would you care, would you please explain that? Um, well, um, let me just say that Rosicrucians is uh, uh, an aspect of Christianity, esoteric Christianity, in which they really uh, uh, focus on not only the right behaviors uh, of people and communities, but really to be able to have a deep, intimate relationship with, I'll continue to use the word, the mystery or spirit. And they had practices for that, practices in prayer, practices in meditation, practices in visualization. You, you were talking about um, doing body work. Tell us more about that aspect of your work. Um, I was studying meditation in India with a really fully realized person from my point of view. And he had a Western physician named Randolph Stone. Randolph Stone was the founder of polarity therapy. So he, um, uh, my wife would get migraine headaches. People said, go see Dr. Stone. He would work on her and he would teach me how to do it too. So for this period of months that we were there, studying meditation, he had he began to show me how to do different moves. And I was like a glass half empty. I, I wasn't trying to get it. I was there for meditation. Sometimes he'd wake me up at one o'clock in the morning and say, come over and help me with this client. And at the very end, you know, he held my hands and he said, you'll be good at this work. And 
that kind of opened to me. I had been studying psychology and philosophy, but um, that began a, really a, a decade year of apprenticeship with him. And then I learned, I don't know if your readers are familiar with things like um, Rolfing or structural integration. I was one in, on one of the very first trainings. I got to meet Moshe Feldenkrais of Feldenkrais work and also really studied deeply a lot of Reikian work. And um, what I found, you know, and, and in my work is that one of the strongest ways to really, well, first of all, I'll back up and say, I would claim that the self that we are and our bodies are in, intimately linked together. Now, usually when you say body, people think of somebody in a magazine cover that has 0 0.03 body fat and all these glistening muscles are the right look. But by body, I mean, it's this shape, this soma, that is the, um, the domain of mood, emotions, thinking, feeling, action, coordination, learning. It all happens here. It all happens here. So doing hands-on body work, which we do at Strozzi Institute, which includes touch, an informed touch, breath, conversations, utterances, gestures, is a one way to begin to touch the self and cultivating the self. There has been a great deal of work done on body memory, the body remembering. Um, tell us what your experience of that is. Um, there's a number of domains, a number of stages we can look at this. One would be that we could have had a traumatic experience in our life that was so big that the most intelligent thing to do is to put it in a compartment and to store it away. People think of that like my mind's doing that, but essentially that storage goes into our bodies. It's in our tissues, deeply in our tissues. And uh, while it may have been an intelligent move to make at that time in someone's life, it takes energy to hold that. So that energy in which one might be freer to be expressive, to bring in, freer to bring in the world, freer to love more, freer to, freer to make more contact is limited because a lot of that energy is to holding this. So in doing the body work, it's not uncommon that there will be a recovery of those hidden memories that will come up. And if somebody is out adequately trained in it, you can move somebody to integrate that energy and that trauma back into them. I think the other place is that by moving into the body in this particular way, or, or many different ways, we, we can talk about meditation as many, many forms, is that there's a place in which we actually contact something that's below all of our social conditioning, all of our historical automatic triggerings and reactions. And by touching that, we're actually, it actually illuminates how we see in the world, how we act in the world, and how we take care of what we would say is most important in the world. And that can happen through working what I would call through the body. We work on the body, which would be a person has migraine headaches, low back pain, um, maybe stomach problems, digestive problems. You work on the body to take care of the symptom. Then we work with the body. Working with the body is that person that goes, you know, my neck is out. We get it fixed. Two weeks later, it's out again. Fix it. Two weeks later, they come back and you say, what happens to have your neck go out? And they might say, every time I talk to Bobby or my boss, my neck goes out. So then we realize it has to do with the social domain, the, in the relationship domain. And then there's this place we work through the body. And working through the body, as I've mentioned before, is really touching into that core energy that we call spirit or essence or source that makes us who we are. And 
I would say by doing that, and all of these three things can work together, like Matryoshka balls, dolls, but really to work through the body is where the deepest level of transformation and healing occurs. I find it quite fascinating thinking about it because there's so much that we are so physical. I mean, it sounds like an obvious statement, but it's what I mean by that is that we forget because we're often so much in our heads that we forget that we have a body, which is an absurd thing to do given that <laughs> everything happens because of our bodies. But we do spend a lot of time in our heads and, I, and we forget that there is a connection between the mind and the body. And yet our bodies respond to emotion and we all have that experience, you know, the butterflies in the stomach, the, the heart racing when we're excited or stressed. We all have these experiences, but we somehow fail to appreciate what that actually means at a deeper level, that what happens to us at an emotional level can actually be stored in the tissue in the body. And, and that's quite, quite an extraordinary thought. Yes, you know, some in the West, we would say some 600 years ago, that group of, of uh, philosophers, Cartesian rationalist philosophers began to divide the body and the mind. And they did it to take care of some, you know, really social problems at the time. But really what it's left us with is that, for example, our children will spend six to eight hours a day sitting in chairs and they learn things. It's good to learn those things. We are rational beings, but it really has atrophied our capacity to feel. And when I say feel, I don't mean have a feeling or have an emotion, although that could happen. But again, you're connecting with the life form of the body. It's just not a concept that you have um, or an idea that you have. It's actually a experience felt sense. And that experience felt sense can help us make some hard decisions. It can help us have the courageous conversations. It can help us fully live our grieving so we don't compact or contract ourselves. Absolutely. And um, I'm really happy to see, I mean, you know, when I first started working in organizations, Anna, um, I would work individually in small teams. Then I would work with organizations and have these group of uh, managers or leaders. And then I would say what we're going to do, what's going to happen, build relevance. And then I would say, now let's stand. And they would look at me like I was the man on the moon. Like, what do you mean stand? I said, this way we get to feel our bodies more. And really they would say, what does my body have to do with my work? Which is a grave misunderstanding and leads to a lot of mischief in that way. It reminds me of the, you know, in the Dublin Ears by James Joyce. And he talked about, this was, post-industrialization, a Mr. Duffy, who lived a short distance from his body and the, and the horrors of that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think it's, it's very interesting because we place so much emphasis on thought and the rational that we have become emotionally detached. So we're de emotionally detached but then we're also physically detached too. And, and I just, I was just thinking about the, the war on the body, which has been, I guess began with a rejection of sensuality with, through relig various religious um, doctrines where the body is meant to be mortified, it's meant to be denied. Um, there's so much emphasis on denying the physicality. Um, and here's where we've got to, <laughs> between that and then 
everything else that's come along, it's quite, um, in some respects, a sorry state. Indeed. I, I, would, I would add to that by saying one of the reasons that so much conflict can so easily precipitate into violence is that we're out of touch with our bodies, out of touch with the capacity to feel. One of the reasons that we are, can so easily stain our water and pollute our air is that we're out of touch with our bodies. And um, uh, one of the reasons that there is this increasing gap between those that have and those that don't have, that those people in the margin is because we're out of touch with our feeling compassion itself. And um, I would say one of the remedies for these things, not there's many other things to do, but one is the more that we get in touch with our own feeling sense and able to feel other life forms. You know, Epictetus, I think I mentioned this already, but he had this great, great quote of, don't tell me, don't explain your philosophy, embody it. Yes, I, I think that's, um, that's about right. Um, I was just thinking about memory again and memory being stored in tissue. What do you feel about the prospect of past life experiences also being stored in the body? I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in previous lives. You know, as I always like to say, the last five minutes will have empirical evidence of all this. But I believe in past lives uh, and that we carry, we carry impressions in our tissues of those past lives. And to a certain degree, whatever became unfinished or unresolved or unintegrated, that is in our tissues to complete in this particular lifetime. And so, you know, uh, like you used earlier, like the connection between the mind and the body, but I like to speak of it as this, this shape is, includes all those things right in this shape, including what happened in the womb and what happened when we were a different shape at a different time in life, yes. Well, this is um, why we, we have a book entitled Embodying the Mystery, because there are indeed so many mysteries to um, delve into. And so I am going to be putting a link to your book in the description box and inviting our audience to um, read about your wonderful experiences. And I thank you very much for your time today, Richard. Thank you for doing that, Anne. I appreciate it very much. And um, uh, it's been good talking with you. I appreciate your, the work you've done that you bring that insight into our conversation. Thank you. If people wanted to um, find out more about your work, how do they do that? The best way is to go to strozyinstitute.com. Strozy, um, is spelled S-T-R-O-Z-Z-I, -Z Institute, one word, strozyinstitute.com. And we do our programs um, throughout the US, in England, in Europe, um, Central America, South America, you know, around. So you can see all the work that we do there. Wonderful. So I'll be putting, link, putting a link to that in the description box as well. Thank you so much once again, Richard. You have a good evening. Anna. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Um, until next time, goodbye. <laughs>